Good afternoon and uh, welcome back from lunch. It was a great lunch. I had a nice conversation with the people at my table. Uh, so my name is Paul Liu and I'm here to present some work uh, performed within my research group at the University of Alberta. Uh, my students were Cam McDonald, Xiao Di Ke, and Adam Wolf Gordon, which of course means they did all the heavy lifting on this work. And uh, at some point, if you have questions, uh, depending on level of abstraction, I may have to uh, put you in touch with the students, but I'll try my best in explaining some of the things we've been working on and answering your questions. I should point out that Cam really should be the person making this presentation, but he literally just defended his PhD yesterday and he thought one other thing was just a little bit too much to take on, so he wishes he could be here. He was at the one in Boston last year. And I want to point out, since it's been recorded, that Cam specifically in his thesis thanks the KVM community uh, for all the, uh, the work that they've uh, put in with him as he implemented what I'm going to be talking about, which is the Nahani system for intervirtual machine shared memory. And he specifically thanks Avi Kavitti, Anthony Liguori, Christian Bornträger, and uh, Alexander Graf. So uh, it's been a lot of fun for Cam and for myself working with this community. So my presentation today will have three main parts, and they're kind of addressed at potentially three different kinds of people in the audience. So many of you are QMU or KVM developers, and for that audience, well, I'll talk a bit about something that Cam talked about last year in Boston, which is the Nahani or IV Shmem system. And uh, for those of you who might be more on the user side rather than developer side, if you're interested in using KVM and virtual machines for web services and web servers, I'll talk about some of the work built on top of IV Shmem, called, uh, in particular related to a system called Memcached. And then for those of you, like myself, given my other research interests, who might be interested in more computationally intensive computational science applications on top of KVM, I'll, I'll be talking about some work we've been doing with what's called the message passing system. And I do encourage you to ask questions as we go along. So I'm using the PDF version of my presentation, so all the animation is more or less missing. But let's look at this diagram, which is the high level view of Nahani, which is the, our pet name for Ivy Shmem. Uh, let's go from bottom up. So what is IV Shmem? IV Shmem is a mechanism to allow virtual machines to share memory if they're running on the same host. So they have to be co-located. So if you've got virtual machines running on different nodes on a cluster, this particular mechanism does not apply. There's a larger argument, which I won't get into right now, that basically says that as the, the many core revolution continues on and as scheduling becomes more sophisticated, the chances of VMs being co-located will also increase. Uh, you may debate me on that, but we'll leave that for a different time. So what is IV Shmem, what is Nahani? Well, from the bottom up, it's basically a new, oops, it's basically a new virtual PCI device implemented in QMU. And as my previous slide hinted at, it was accepted into 0.130 approximately a year ago. And it's meant to be, and by design, something very straightforward. It's a PCI device that you, on the command line, would specify uh, as follows here. Basically, you want the particular device, uh, give it a name, give it a size. And the implementation within QMU then, as a result of that command line argument, creates POSIX shared memory on the host. So that's where we start. When you initiate your QMU instances, uh, it creates this POSIX shared memory. Then the idea is to map it from the host all the way up to the user level within the guest. And going from bottom up again, uh, the first thing is that if you want to use this mechanism, you have to have a very small driver within the guest operating system. And it's only used basically for initialization. It's part of this process of taking this uh, shared memory and mapping it uh, into the guest now at the guest operating system level. And basically it looks a lot like a graphics card. So it looks like this device of a huge amount of graphics memory, and then it maps itself into the guest. If you don't want to use this mechanism, you don't load the driver, there's no performance impact, nothing has changed in the guest OS. But if you use the driver, then the idea is that your user level library would initiate uh, the driver and it would do the mapping. And when it's all done, when initialization, initialization is done, the guest OS and the host OS basically has no more involvement other than the fact that, of course, we're using POSIX shared memory being provided by the host. But it basically is an OS bypass approach to sharing data between virtual machines. Once you've mapped this memory to the different uh, VM guests, 
There's no other change to the operating systems, either at the guest or the host level. And as I hinted at before, we're going to talk about two uses of this, this memcached use case, which is an example of using what we call structured data. Basically, it's the data structure of pointers, which, of course, is very different from stream data, what we're usually familiar with with things like socket communication. But we'll also look at message passing and stream data. So one of the points we would like to make about this mechanism is it gives you that choice. If you want to keep your data in structured form with pointers, this will work for that. Or if you just want to use this mechanism to accelerate stream data, it will work for that. And we'll give you a couple of use cases for those. So that's basically the high level view of what Nahani is and some of the things we're going to talk about using it. And as I pointed out, it's Cam's PhD thesis. So without the animation, this diagram looks a little weird, but all that is really trying to show is that because we create the POSIX shared memory in the host, and then we map it upwards ultimately to the user level and the guest, now two guests, as long as they use the same name for that virtual memory, that IV Schmem device, uh, two guests can share that same physical, same uh, memory rather, share memory, and the host and guest can also share that as well. I'll pause there in case you have any questions about the basic idea. Yes? Sorry, I've been very interested in this, and I don't mean to short circuit you, but um, how do you deal with security and kind of coordination? How do you get authorizations on that? I'll give you a short answer, and then maybe we can discuss it further at the end or maybe offline. The short answer, of course, is that this is POSIX shared memory. It uses the, the file system namespace to decide who can access this shared memory object, basically. So it's file system uh, permissions and security. Two virtual machines have to be able to access this uh, in order for this to work. And if they don't have the permissions, they don't. So it's all at the file system naming level. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So that's got pluses and minuses, of course, but that's the answer. Okay, so moving on, um, I, I won't put up any numbers for this. Last year when Cam first introduced this idea, he talked about host to guest data transfers, just simple test cases of moving large files from the host into the guest and vice versa. And our conclusion at that point was that um, it's a lot faster uh, with our mechanism and he compared it against Netcat, uh, a ver variation of secure <coughs> copy and an IP file system that uh, QMU supports. So that's kind of the old news. Now, many of you might be thinking, okay, it kind of sounds good, but really, who really wants, who really needs this shared memory between virtual machines and guests and hosts? And a perfectly valid question. So for the past year, we've been working on use cases, like what is this thing good for, and what are the benefits if you decide to use it? And so the, the second part of my presentation is the first of the use cases, which is the hypothetical situation that your company that wants to deploy your web service, your web servers, your system uh, on a cloud environment. And we know today that basically all the IaaS cloud environments are based on virtual machines. So bear with me, let's make that assumption. And we know that companies, well-known companies like Reddit and Foursquare are doing this on Amazon. We know Amazon isn't using KVM and all this stuff, but we're looking down the road for when these, these uh, cloud providers might be using KVM and a system like Nahani. So who here is familiar with the memcached key value store? Just as a show of hands. Some of you. Um, it's a system, it's a very simple key value cache. Uh, meant to be very simple, and it's also extremely widely used by some of the biggest websites out there, the Facebooks, the Twitters. And it's meant, of course, to save on latency from going all the way to some backend, either SQL database or no SQL, whatever. It's meant to save that latency. If you looked it up once, you stick it in memcached according to some key, and then you look it up there later. And that's really all that is meant to do, and it does a very good job of that. So under the assumption that we've got uh, virtual machines running front-end web servers, back-end databases, and now memcached inside virtual machines, if a front-end web server, for example, is co-located with one of these memcached servers, and typically you have many of them across your cluster or your cloud or whatever, so it's not usually one, you have many of them. If you have, basically it's a client server, if your client wanting to look up a value is co-located with the server, the memcached server, and they share this memory, well, wouldn't that be the fastest way? Wouldn't that be a fast way to access that data rather than send a message across a socket? And even that socket actually gets transferred over a virtual network or whatever, wouldn't your memory be faster? And our results, and this is mainly due to Adam Wolf Gordon's uh, work, 
is, yeah, it's 29% faster on a workload, and I'll explain that in a moment, that we took from the Yahoo cloud serving benchmark. So we took someone else's workload, uh, it's a read mostly workload, and we measured latency, which is a little bit different than what we usually talk about. We usually talk about bandwidth, but this is about latency, and it's 29% faster, and I'll present you some details next. S sorry. You know, another slide, I forgot I'm gonna have to set up the uh, particular configuration. So we were doing all of our experiments, both for this section and for the following section on a s one physical server, remember it assumes co-location, so we're not talking about uh, servers on a network, talking about one server. It's a little bit small to today, it's eight cores with the specifications you see here. And so uh, some details on the workload below, which I'll skip in my verbal presentation, but the basic setup is this, I've got three virtual machines on the physical server, memcached is actually running on the host, so this is host guest sharing of memory in particular, and the back end store here just happens to be Cassandra, it could be MySQL, it could be anything you want, in this case it's Cassandra, and using the Nahani mechanism, memcached and the three virtual machines by virtue of their memcached client library share this virtual memory, and the idea is normally if this virtual machine wanna look something up, it creates a message, sends it across a socket. But with the shared memory now, instead of sending message across a socket, it just goes to that shared memory region, it synchronizes of course, it uses locks or whatever synchronization, and it just looks things up by walking pointers. It's a hash table basically. So rather than create a message, we just go to the shared memory, we synchronize, we look things up. That should be faster, one would think. And in our experimentation, obviously I'm leaving out, leaving out quite a few details, but of course we said, okay, let's see if this is faster. So building at the top of Cam's Nahani, we tried variations, of course. We tried different kinds of virtualized and para-virtualized networking mechanisms. This is sort of a, a full uh, graph from Adam's thesis. I just wanna focus on the last two bars, if you be, be, bear with me. So what we did was we had this workload. Uh, what was it? It was... Um, 36 million operations from three different virtual machines. And in this workload, it's a read mostly workload, so sometimes it would do a read and it, uh, it would, it would uh, miss in cache, so it would have to go back to Cassandra and get it. And if we do a stack bar graph on an average per operation basis and break it down, we see that, of course, sometimes we're gonna miss in memcached, so we have to go all the way to Cassandra, that's the red bar. This is, as you can see, is kind of a constant between these two variations that I'm focusing on right now. So what I really wanna talk about then are the, the yellow and the green portions. So the yellow is also more or less constant between these two variations, and the variations are, as you can see from the bottom, the shorter bar is Nahani. It's gonna be faster, and I'll try to explain exactly why. And then the larger bar here is memcached stock man cache D, but it uses um, sockets, but with vertio and vhost uh, mechanisms turned on. So most people would say that if you're doing this kind of communication, you would use vertio and uh, vhost, so we're comparing against that. And so we can't do anything about the Cassandra time, that's just Cassandra, there's nothing we can do to accelerate that. And uh, at least at the time when this was created, this graph, uh, the write operations where you go look it up in cache, you don't find it, you get it from Cassandra, then you gotta write it back to memcached for next time. That write operation was done over a socket, so we hadn't optimized that yet. We've since changed that, but that's an aside. So we can't do anything about the yellow and the red, but look what happens to the green. The green basically is that read operation that you're looking something up by going directly to shared memory and you find it there. And that goes basically from 0.41 um, milliseconds to 0.11. It's a reduction of 73% on the read ops. Over the entire workload, a mixture of reads and writes and misses and whatnot, it reduces the latency by 29%. Okay, so that's our first use case. And we, we tried very hard to find something that was relevant. Memcached is used by a lot of websites. We try to find a reasonable workload we could talk about other workloads, but the Yahoo one was an independent one, and these are our results, that this technique, on one hand, not too surprising, we expect it to be faster, on the other hand, we're providing specific evidence of that it is faster, and that it's, in this particular case, 29% faster on the workload. Any questions about that before I move on, yes? Uh, yeah, you know what, just a question, like, uh, what do you use for synchronization between two VMs? 
Okay, so basically locks and specifically spin locks. So they have to lock a data structure into shared memory, which allows them to walk the hash table to do the lookup. But then beyond that, there's no other necessary synchronization on our read. Did so like uh, plans for any sort of eventing? So that, for example, you know, one VM can event another another VM through a Yes. I mean, I'm talking more and more from a talk space where we have to, you know, we cannot spend too much time in spin locks. I understand. So spin locks have their drawbacks is what you're hitting at. So the short answer is I won't talk about it here, but um, one of the students, Shao DK, he did implement uh, interrupts like events and he uses um, the, no, I won't go too much into it, he uses the uh, Virtual serial mechanism, which is all sorts of pluses and minuses. But we do have an implementation of events and interrupts. Uh, but I won't, it's not part of these numbers, but I'd be happy to talk with you about that offline, for example. Question, Dor? It's, it's a bit uh, interesting question, though. So, speed locks, if the uh, cache can be served really fast, it's going to be faster than a virtual serial. But there is a, a non upstream work of uh, power virtualized spin locks. It's, uh, if you spin, then you just wait some memory. With, with PD spin locks, the host can sig signal to you directly might be accelerate some There's definitely a, a whole new line of interesting design and research questions about how to do inter-virtual machine blocking and signaling, which uh, this work does not attempt to address. And of course, we're only going to spin if there's contention. So um, I mean, there's still some drawbacks, but that's our partial answer to that. Other questions? Okay, so that was use case number one. It's a, it's a little bit unusual. Usually we emphasize bandwidth and all of this, but this is a latency test. And if you talk, if you read the blogs from Facebook, they're very latency sensitive, which is why they use memcached to reduce latency. So the ability to re reduce latency further in this particular case of co-location, uh, we think is an interesting use case. And, and, and perhaps it coincides with something that uh, you're working on as well. So the last part, the third category of use cases is, and this is a bit controversial, is what if you work in an area of high performance computing or computational science and you want to use virtual machines in the cloud? It's a bit controversial because these people are known for, I don't want to give up any overheads related to virtual machines, so they would kind of resist this to begin with, but we also know that there are many other reasons and, and benefits from using virtual machines for even something like this. And so really it comes down to, well, how low can we get the overheads so that these HPC people can be convinced that this is useful? So I don't say this is an obvious, uh, everyone would agree a good use case, but I think the goal is to get these overheads down so that they will see this as a potential platform for their work. So if you're in HPC, there's a very good chance you're familiar with and the codes that you work with have a message passing implementation and the, basically the standard these days is something called MPI. So what we did is we took a well-known implementation of MPI called MPitch2. They already had a shared memory implementation in MPitch2 which they called Nemesis. And so what we did was we took that and we ported over to use, instead of System5 shared memory without virtual machines, we use Nahani shared memory between virtual machines. So one of the things we would argue as academics about the way Nahani is implemented and the way it works is that it smells like, it feels like, it basically is shared memory. So if you have codes that already are implemented to take advantage of shared memory, porting it over to this mechanism, Nahani, IV Shmem, is relatively straightforward. And Although I don't have the details in this presentation, that's exactly what the student found. He basically did it, I think it was really just a couple of weeks. Now, a couple of weeks of a really hardworking graduate student, mind you, but it wasn't a big onerous thing because it really is just shared memory. So we took MPitch2 Nemesis from a different group, we ported it over to use Nahani, and now I'm going to show you in a few moments a bunch of performance measurements to show how fast is it to do message passing between virtual machines. The short answer, the conclusion, I tell my students, never bury the lead, don't put the, the conclusion at the very end. The conclusion is that uh, our implementation of uh, MPI based on MPitch2 is um, significantly faster on, on micro benchmarks, and when it comes to full applications, uh, it's, it varies, as we will see, but up to 30% faster. And this is work that Shaudi and uh, Cam did. 
So here's our first graph. Um, so what we see here is two lines. The x-axis is size of message, very typical kind of network bandwidth graph and also message passing graph. Y-axis is bandwidth, so higher lines are better, higher data points are better. And the two points we're comparing here are our MPI Nahani, which uses MPitch2 but with shared memory between virtual machines ver oops, versus MPI vHost, which is just simply MPI, MPitch2, running using sockets, but those sockets are across virtualized um, networking with uh, VertIO and vHost turned on. So again, people would probably say this is the fastest way to do inter-virtual machine networking on the same host. And here's what we see. Uh, substantial differences in bandwidth achieved. Now, I'll be honest, we really don't know, we can't explain the MPI vHost performance and one of the hopes in presenting here is to engage people who are interested in tracking that down, but this is what we're reporting what we see. And so MPI vHost uh, basically gets bandwidth well under, you know, this is a thousand megabytes per second, but using the shared memory, we can get quite a bit higher. You know, on this end of the scale, a factor of up to six times. Question or comment, sir? Can you kick your MPU up on your bridge? Did I, sorry? Did you kick the MTU up on your bridge or were you still at 1,500 bytes? Um, I actually don't know off the top of my head the answer to that. So I understand the point you're making, that you need larger packets in order to make this work. For those sizes, I mean, if you're not using physical hardware, you're staying on the same box. Yeah, so it's a very good point. I don't remember offhand, so uh, I don't have a good answer for you, but that's obviously something to consider. Two combination will, will, will take away the need to increase the MTU size. So, so the MTU generally, of course, has a big impact on large messages. And let me just go to the next slide. We're seeing quite a big difference even on small messages. So I don't have an answer for you, but if we look at small messages where that is a lesser effect, uh, we see, for example, 250 bytes and smaller, you know, there's difference between 4.8 megabytes per second and 975. Now, there may be a small fix. Maybe it's an MTU, relation, MTU fix. Maybe it's something else, but we're reporting what we see, Dor. Uh, just to understand better, uh, do you actually send messages with Nahani? Because you, you can place all of the messages on the shared memory. But do you need to signal the others? Or do you, do you just do the speed locks uh, approach to? Right. So the short answer, first of all, we didn't write the benchmark. It's something called NetPipe 2. And yes, it does, it does send messages. So we haven't modified the standard benchmark. That benchmark, which someone else wrote, does actually move the data back and forth so from sender buffer to receiver buffer. So the answer is yes, data is actually moving. So the, the benefit that you're getting out of Nahani is uh, basically the zero copy stuff. Um, there's still some copying going on within the NPI library. I think the benefits in are, are things like, obviously, protection domain transitions, because this is a complete OS bypass. So, and with spin locks, I never have to go into the OSs. So I think that's one element of this, um, especially latency, maybe not so much bandwidth. Uh, and other benefits are um, just maybe, you know, caching issues, like hardware cache line caching issues and things like that. We, um, there's just not a lot of tools to try to understand why vHost gets the performance it gets and, and things like that. So I don't, I don't have a complete answer. But yes, data is being moved back and forth between sender and receiver on this. Does every message have to be acknowledged, or is it informed, or is it a stream of messages? Okay. So certainly, when you do the vHost, there's an acknowledgement um, for the MPI Nahani. It's, it's whatever mpitch nemesis 2 does, or mpitch 2 nemesis does. And yes, there is either implicit or explicit acknowledgement. I mean, it's, it's a reliable protocol, I guess, is the bottom line. Well, yes, One more start. question. Uh, do you know offhand in the benchmark if the receiver of the data is, is touching every byte of the message? Is it actually? Good question. Reading all the data that it's receiving, or is it? Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I don't know the answer to off the top of my head. It's whatever NetPipe, to, NetPipe does, but I don't know the specific answer. That's a very good question, though. So I should also point out that I'm only presenting NetPipe here, but we also ran a, a, a similar two-sided bandwidth benchmark from the Ohio State University people, the guys behind MVAPitch, which is an InfiniBand, you know. So we ran multiple benchmarks, and although the lines change a little bit, 
the, the performance difference still exists. And these are fantastic suggestions for us to consider as to why. Um, you know, there is this performance gap, um, but it shows up on multiple benchmarks as the bottom line. So uh, micro benchmarks, interesting. Probably not what you care most about. Uh, I got one other, sorry. That was a premature transition. Let me finish off a couple more micro benchmarks. Here, so you might say, okay, um, you might have that performance, but how do you compare against, for example, there's a lot of research in the world of Zen for these kinds of uh, optimized MPI kind of communications. And so we haven't done a head-to-head -head comparison of Zen yet. There's a whole bunch of issues with versions of Zen and all this stuff, but we did do the following. So here's actually the complete set of data points from Shaudi's thesis. So we, we did a whole bunch of you know, different combinations of para-virtualized mechanisms and things like that. And here's the take home message from this. We actually ran unmodified MPitch2 nemesis that the other group wrote on our hardware without virtual machines. So this kind of represents a high level of performance. And what we see here and what the arrows here show is that the performance of MPI Nahani basically tracks, it's a little bit lower in places, than the performance of MPI on the hardware itself without any virtualization. So if we take the non-VM case as being the upper bound of what we're gonna be able to achieve, we're pretty much at that upper bound. So that's the other message I wanna convey of this data. Latency, so that was bandwidth, this is latency, so lower Data points are better here. Basically, the blue line is Nahani. Basically, uh, very low latency, as you would expect from shared memory. Um, the MPI V host, with all the optimizations, it's still got some overheads, and we see basically, um, you know, 50 uh, microseconds versus pretty much pretty, you know, low single-digit microseconds for MPI Nahani. And we did the same thing by comparing it without virtualization, and the Nahani case basically overlaps the non-virtualization case. Again, an indication of could we be even lower or could we be even higher? And in both cases, we're pretty much at the upper bound or lower bound of what we can achieve. And I'm looking at the time, and I'm keeping aware of the time. Um, I will talk about the last set of benchmarks. So if you're into computational science and MPI, you probably know about SPEC MPI. It's an industry standard benchmark. So we got the codes. Uh, we were able to get nine out of 13 to run. We had some issues with Fortran compiler stuff with some of them. And we ran it on the medium data set to compare, okay, does this micro benchmark benefit translate to full applications? And the short answer is yes, it does, with the following observations. So here's the spec MPI codes we're able to run along the x-axis, the nine of them. And here's the, here's the conclusions I would like to draw. First of all, how much faster Nahani was relative to MPI running over vHost depends on the application. No surprise there. It goes from a low of, you know, almost exactly the same, 0.6% faster, probably within error, to an extreme case and this is puzzling to us, and we welcome your input, where for the POP2 application, um, we were 79% faster than vHost, and, and, and almost the same performance as without virtualization. So we always use non-virtualization as sort of the you know, upper bound or lower bound, depending on how you look at it for our performance. Uh, and for that, we don't, we don't look at this and go, oh yeah, there's something spectacularly good going on. We look at it as, we don't really understand with this data point. So for most of the other applications, you know, we're in the, for an eight process MPI computation, we're in the single digits up to the double digits faster using the shared memory rather than vHost and VertIO. So, okay, that's not really impressive, 13%, that's not all that impressive, but here's our conclusion as well. When we compare two processes and performance gains, four processes and eight, we see the following pattern. The circles there are the data points for four processes. They're all within 5% uh, faster. And here's the observation from this particular graph. That's because those particular codes when running with four processes only spend about 5% of their time in MPI. We can't make the computation faster, we can only make the communication faster. So if you spend about 5% of your actual total runtime in MPI, we're about 5% faster. And when you go and scale up to eight processes, you spend more time in MPI and we're correspondingly that much faster as well. So there's, there's very direct relationship in terms of how much time you spend in MPI and how much faster we can make it basically. 
I will finish up very quickly. We also looked at a different application, something from uh, quantum chemistry called games, where CAM basically took their communication layer, which is not MPI, and ported it to use shared memory. They already had a shared memory implementation. And this is where we get our 30%, our high watermark, so to speak, where again, the performance improvement you get depends on the application, in this case, even depends on the input. We have four different molecules being simulated here, and it varies from 5.1% up to 30.8. So your mileage may vary depending on how much time you communicate in that particular run. But the correlation also exists. This is 30% faster because this particular run spent 30% of its time within MPI. If you spend less time in MPI, we can't do so much. We're 1% faster because you spend about 1% there. And here's my last slide, and I thank you for your indulgence. We wanted to sort of remind you and bring to your attention again the fact that this IV Schmen mechanism has been in the code base for about a year. We look at it as an alternative mechanism, certainly not a replacement. It's just another option if you care about the things that we've been looking at. It's another way for low latency, high bandwidth communication between virtual machines. It is a true OS bypass uh, design, and it supports both stream data and pointer-based data. So we looked at the case of low latency for web servers and memcached, and we looked at the case of MPI type codes for message passing. And so if you have further questions or interests, Thank you.